of avoiding this skyrocketing debt that we are otherwise going to experience. But Mr. President, this amendment, this legislation before us would stop it in its tracks. I think that would be a profound mistake. I hope my colleagues reject this ill-considered plan. I thank the chair and yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from Texas is recognized. Mr. President, I rise to speak in favor of the plan that is before us, the Cut, Cap, and Balance Act. And Mr. President, I also think there are some very important uh, achievements in the Group of Six uh, proposal. It's a proposal. It's not in legislative language. Uh, it has many things in it that are very good. It has tax cuts. It has entitlement reform. Uh, it has spending cuts. Uh, it's a complicated uh, outline and one that needs to be fleshed out to know exactly what is in it. Um, and it has some areas with which I disagree. Um, I certainly want to assure that we keep the 15 percent cap gains and dividends rate. Uh, but we also have another proposal uh, that I think has great merit. And I, I think the bill that has come over from the House, the Cut, Cap, and Balance Act, uh, puts even more uh, together to address the issues that we're all trying to address. What we need are spending cuts that are real, not proposed down the road or promised or will act on it later. And that's what the Cut, Cap, and Balance Act will do. We all know we have a $14.3 trillion debt ceiling that is getting ready to be hit sometime in the month of August. What we need to do in this Senate, in the Congress, and, and certainly hopefully the President, is give confidence to the markets. Now that means we do two things. We raise the debt ceiling. We don't default or even scare people that we're going to default with reforms that will assure that we will not have to ever do it again. That is what we must do to send a message to the markets that we are going to get our fiscal house in order and we are going to assure that our debts are paid, that the people who work uh, on federal contracts in our military, Social Security recipients will get their paychecks. We've got to assure the markets to raise the debt ceiling, we've got to show that we are going to cut back on spending. That is the key. We've got to tackle the core problem. We've got to stop spending too much, borrowing too much, and taxing too much. We don't have a taxing problem in this country. We have a spending problem. We're not being taxed too little. We're spending too much. With $2.2 trillion in tax revenue collected, the federal government has the ability to live within its means. We must prioritize and we must make sure that we get a private sector economy that will hire people. And I can tell you that small businesses are not hiring because they are terrified of the health care bill that was passed year before last. They are terrified of the costs involved in that. And secondly, they are looking at people in Washington talking about more taxes. And they're saying, I am freezing right now. Not going to take a chance that I'm going to have a new employee that is going to cost more than the productivity that we can add to our business and keep going. So the cut, cap, and balance bill would make significant spending cuts now. It also requires the passage of a balanced budget amendment to the Constitution. Now that's the long term. It takes a two-thirds vote of both houses to do that, but we need to do it. We need to put the federal government on the same kind of fiscal constraints that almost every state in our nation has. And that is a constitutional requirement that we have a balanced budget, that we don't borrow 
that we don't borrow for operational expenses. We can borrow for uh, long-term projects or bonds, absolutely, but we're not going to borrow for our immediate needs. That is what kills the, the governments that overspend, of which the United States federal government is one. We need to have the balanced budget amendment that is in this bill passed, knowing that it's not going to be an immediate fix because the states would have to ratify it. More than half the states will have to ratify a constitutional amendment. In that constitutional amendment, we have an 18 percent of gross domestic product cap on federal spending because that will put our fiscal house in order. But we know that's long term and certainly we want to get started on that long term constitutional amendment fix because once we do it and once the states ratify it and I believe they will, then we will have the ability to assure future generations that we will never be in the fix we're in now. Today, the federal government is spending 24% of GDP. The 40-year average is 20.6%. So we have a, about a 3% increase in federal spending level that is juxtaposed against a gross domestic product. So if we put a spending cap of 18 percent in a constitutional amendment, we will have time to start drawing that down so that it won't be an immediate hit. In fact, uh, the bill that is before us has a gradual decrease in the caps on spending. So we have the constitutional amendment part, that's the balance part. We also have a cap in the bill that is before us. And it's not a, an immediate cut to 18 percent but it does ratchet down 21.7% in the year 2013, 20.8% in 2014, and so forth till we get to 2021, which would have a 19.9% spending cap on gross domestic product. So it is a gradual cut between 2013 and 2021 in the cap on federal spending. I think that is a responsible approach, and that's why I am fully supporting this bill. That's the cap part. We have the cut part that is real cuts. We have the cap part that puts the lid on spending going forward. And then we have the balanced budget part, which goes to the states and goes through our constitutional process to put us in the same situation that most states are in, and that is with constitutional provisions that you have balanced budgets. One of the most valuable economic lessons that we have in this country, because we have learned from history, is that you can't spend your way out of debt. That is the worst remedy that you would be, ever even think about. If you're a family in debt, you don't keep spending and you don't put a freeze on spending either, which is what was suggested in President Obama's budget. He said, well, we'll just freeze at 2011 levels. But 2011 levels are inflated because of the huge stimulus bill that was passed. You've got an inflated level, and you say, let's freeze there. No, we need to freeze at a lower level. We need to start ratcheting down the spending in this country in order to assure that we start going toward a balanced budget. The Cut, Cap, and Balance Act is a reasonable way to cut spending now so that we will not have that debt ceiling lifted again because we'll start bringing down the deficit and not hit that debt limit again. So we bring down the deficits with immediate spending cuts. Then we go forward with a cap that starts at 21.7% in 2013, knowing that we're at 24% now, you've got to have those immediate cuts to start getting down 
to the reasonable level. Now, there's one more thing that we need to do that is not in this bill, but is something that if we're going to have the long-term debt reduction, we've got to look at, ex at the entitlement expenditures. Because our discretionary expenditures are roughly 20% of the total expenditures of our country. So we know that we are out of kilter right now in Social Security because the actuarial tables have not been kept up to date. When Social Security was passed, the average man lived to be about 60 years old. Today, the average man lives to be about 73, 77. We are going up in, thank goodness, the life expectancy and the quality of life expectancy. So if we're going to get our fiscal house in order, we do need to address that. Um, we need to have a gradual, a very gradual increase in the retirement age. Um, I have proposed a Social Security reform bill uh, that does adjust the COLA and it also uh, has a gradual increase in the age of retire retirement. It stops at 69. Uh, some proposals are 68. Uh, you can keep going in that direction and try to uh, assure that we are on an actuarial table that actually is today's correct actuarial table. The other thing that uh, the gang of six or the group of six did that I thought was very positive is it put everything that depends on a cost of living adjustment in the federal budget on a different calculation that is determined by uh, economists to be a more realistic spending uh, gauge and it is the CPI, the um, consumer uh, product, I don't know what I is, would the Senator of uh, Tennessee remember what CPI stands for? It's Consumer Index. What? Index. Thank you very much. Um, the CPI is adjusted in the Group of Six proposal uh, that will bring down the cost and will be a more realistic COLA, uh, cost of living increase. So it is very important that we look at that as one of the good parts of the gang of six or group of six uh, proposal because it puts it more in line with reality and it also will uh, save uh, money on the other end uh, on the uh, the long-term strategy that we must have to adjust our fiscal requirements to meet the needs and the revenues that are coming in. So with tax cuts that are also in the Group of Six proposal uh, that would help spur the economy, with the spending cuts that will bring our, our debt uh, interest requirements down, uh, cost of living adjustments that are very minor but will have an impact over the long term. Uh, these are some of the good things that are out there. And let me just say that, uh, in conclusion, that we have had several of our leaders make proposals. Uh, we had Senator Reid and Senator McConnell put out a proposal. And, of course, there were critics on all sides of that proposal. And then we had the group of six that came out with a proposal. Uh, and there were people who criticized that immediately. I think we need to take the nuggets of these proposals, which are, there are some very good parts of the Reed-McConnell bill. There are some very good parts of the group of six uh, uh, proposal. And let's don't kill off people putting forth ideas because that's how we start coming to a conclusion about what is the best. And to criticize uh, the people who have come forward with very bold plans I think is uh, a huge mistake and I think it is unfair to those who have put something out 
uh, to say, oh, that's a terrible plan and we would never vote for it. Are you kidding? I mean, we need to come together with all of the plans. I'm supporting this one, the cut, cap, and balance plan, which I think came mostly from the House and some of our senators. It's very solid. Uh, I certainly think that uh, Senator Reid and McConnell didn't want us to come to August 1st and have no uh, end game, and so they were preparing something that has uh, some merit. They have a 302A allocation in theirs. That's basically a cap on spending. Uh, we need to have that, and that part of their proposal is very sound. And then the group of six that has tax cuts as well as spending cuts and some um, uh, adjustments in the uh, mandatory spending side, the entitlements, we've got to have those ideas all on the table. And then instead of being negative about everything, let's take some of the good parts that we like and see if we can come to a consensus on those. So that's what we have to do if we're going to have an end result that will assure that our obligations are paid sometime in August when the true debt ceiling is hit. I think it's later in August, that's what is in conflict right now, but uh, I think it's later in August. And if we're going to meet those requirements that we have as elected members of Congress, we're going to have to find some way to get there with the reforms that are necessary to give confidence to not only the people who hold our debt, but to the markets that would assure that our economy is not going to collapse either under the heavy burden of this debt. The reforms are a necessary element to lift that debt ceiling or we will not be sending the right message to our debtors nor to the people who might start hiring and getting this 9.2 percent unemployment rate down. So, Mr. President, I hope we can have a very strong, positive vote on the cut, cap, and balance bill. We need to address these issues. Let's put it all together and let's start talking about what we have to do when that debt ceiling is reached. And this is a good start. Thank you, Mr. President, and I yield the floor. Mr. President. The senior senator from Tennessee is recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask consent to speak for up to 15 minutes. Without objection, so ordered. Thanks, Mr. President. I congratulate the senator from Texas for her remarks, for her leadership, for her willingness to, to be involved in and support a variety of ways to help us meet the two goals that we have before us, one of which is to make a significant step to reduce our federal debt, to stop Washington from spending money that it doesn't have, and second, to do so in a way that honors the financial obligations of the United States of America, uh, the most creditworthy country in the world. Before I speak about the Cut, Cap, and Balance Act, which has passed the House, which has 37 co-sponsors in the Senate, I'm proud to be one of them. I think it's a superior uh, piece of legislation. I hope when we vote on it, it gets a majority of votes here in the Senate and becomes law. Uh, before I do that, I'd like to speak for a moment about those two goals that are before us as we, as we uh, consider our debt, consider our financial obligations, and consider all of them up against what is said to be a financial uh, a point on August 2nd where the debt ceiling needs to be increased. And as I think about those two obligations, reducing our debt, honor those two goals, reducing our debt, honoring our obligations. I think about a friend of mine in Tennessee who pays his bills out of a cigar box. Now this is how it works. Uh, a bill comes in to my friend and he puts the bill in a cigar box. And then another bill comes in and he puts that bill in a cigar box. And then, then maybe the next week some money will come in. So my friend will reach down in his cigar bo box and he'll pull a bill out and he'll pay that bill. And then if a little more money comes in the next week, he'll reach down, pull another bill out, and pay that bill. My friend pays his bills out of a cigar box. Now what happens to my friend if he wants to go down to the local bank and say, uh, I'd like to borrow some money in order to pay all the bills that I have in my cigar box? I think what the banker is going to say is, I'm sorry, my friend, but we're reluctant to loan money to you, or if we do, we're going to charge you more for it because we don't know who you're going to pay. 
You might reach down in your cigar box and pay the whiskey store instead of the bank. You might pay the grocery store instead of the principal on your loan. You might pay the service station before you paid us. So because you selectively pay your bills out of your cigar box, you're not a good risk. Uh, we're going to charge you more for your money or we're not going to loan, loan you money at all. That's the risk we take if we play around with this idea of the United States of America, uh, the most creditworthy country in the world, selectively paying its bills, going from being the most creditworthy country to being a country that pays its bills out of a cigar box. There are three obvious reasons why we shouldn't do that. Reason number one is it's going to cost us more. Today, the United States of, money, uh, of America can borrow money for 10 years at about 3%. We are so creditworthy, people trust us so much to pay our obligations, that they'll give us their money for a short period of time at no interest. It's a tremendous advantage to us. The United States has the risk-free credit in the world, and I might add the risk-free credit in an increasingly turbulent world. Now, what if we decided after August 2nd, when we're told sometime in that month we'll begin not to have enough money to pay all of our bills, what if we decided not to raise our debt ceiling and that we would pay our bills out of a cigar box? So we might say, okay, we don't have enough money, so we'll pay China before we pay Grandma her Social Security. Oh, better not do that. In fact, I saw a fellow in Portland, Tennessee on Monday, and I, he said, what's this about my Social Security not being paid? Oh, I said, I think it'll be paid. Might be two or three days, but the telephone calls will come in, and Congress will fix it, and it'll get paid. He said, it better not be five minutes. So we might want to pay all of our Social Security benefits, but the President might say, or the Secretary of Treasury might say, well, we'll pay Grandma our Social Security, but we won't pay uh, the wife of the soldier at Fort Campbell who's in Afghanistan on his third tour. That's not such a good idea, so maybe we won't pay the veterans benefit. We will pay the wife. That doesn't sound so good either. So maybe, what about those 12 to 15 million students who are headed off to college in the next few weeks with a student grant or a student loan from the federal government? Shall we pay just those going to public colleges and let the private colleges take care of their own, just the profits, not the, or just the for profits, not the profits? You see what can happen if we had a country, especially a country like the United States, which instead of paying all of its obligations on time, whether it's to China or Japan or grandma or to the veteran, that we began to selectively pay those bills when we had the money. I think I know what would happen. Instead of being able to borrow money for 10 years at 3%, we might have to pay a little more for it. Let's say it just went from 3% to 4%. What would that mean to us? It would mean, according to the Congressional Budget Office, that the taxpayers would have to pay $1.3 trillion more in interest over 10 years. So if it goes up two percentage points to 5%, that's twice that. Or it goes up to 3%. That's what happens when you pay your bills out of the cigar box. And it's not just the taxpayers. My son told me the other day, he said, Dad, my, my mortgage loan resets in October. If you all don't work this out, that means my interest rate might go up. And let's say he has a $100,000 house loan and it goes up 1%. That's maybe, um, uh, that, that gets to be some, 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 some money for him. Or if it's 2% or it's 3%. So if it's your credit card loan, if it's your home loan, whatever loan it is, it would begin to go up. Paying our bills out of a cigar box would raise our cost. There's a second obvious reason not to do this. Uh, in 2008, we were smacked in the face with a world economic crisis. We didn't expect it. Most of us didn't cause it, but we had to deal with it. And here in the Congress, we had to do some very unpopular things. We had to bail out banks, even some industries. The American people hated that, even though most of the money has been paid back. And we don't know what we averted, probably a much worse problem. But we're still suffering from what happened in 2008. But we didn't do that deliberately. In this case, if we were to deliberately 
go from being the most creditworthy country in the year, world to a country that paid its money, paid its bills out of a cigar box, we would be deliberately injecting our, our uncertainty into a turbulent world. Look at Europe, with the Eurozone trembling over the debt in Portugal and the debt in Greece, with sovereign nations perhaps having to bail out European banks. Look at Japan, the third largest economy in a 10-year recession, with a third of its power plants closed after the tsunami, sweating through the summer with, with an inability to, to sell their goods. Look at China. China's a big success story, but it may be growing too fast. Its inflation is up. and It has a lot of unreported debt at the provincial level. Look at our markets. We make trades in milliseconds, and twice in the last year we've had sudden drops in the market, which we couldn't explain for months. Do we really want to inject this level of uncertainty into the world turbulence that we have today in the financial markets when we know that we could avoid it? I think not. And then there's a third reason, and this is a purely partisan reason. Maybe it's not even appropriate to talk about it on the Senate floor, but let's talk about it for a moment anyway. The president's done a pretty good job of blaming his predecessors for problems. But lately, people have said, Mr. President, we don't blame you for the problems you inherited, but we do hold you responsible for the decisions you've made to make it worse. You've made it worse with the health care mandates and higher individual health care policies. You've made it worse with the financial regulations bill. You've made it worse by not sending over the trade bills. You've made it worse with high cost energy. You've made it worse with your National Labor Relations Board appointments and undermining the right to work law. You've made it worse by proposing to double and triple the debt. People are listening to that. They agree with that. But what will happen if the Republican Party or the Democratic Party or any group of people have the primary responsibility for turning this country from a country that is the most creditworthy country in the world into one that pays its bills out of a cigar box? The President will say, instead of our saying, Mr. President, you made it worse, he will say, you made it worse. So, Mr. President, there's every reason in the world to regard the debt ceiling decision that we have to make as an opportunity to make a significant step to reduce the debt. But we can do that while still honoring our financial obligations, and we should. And today, we're talking about one of those ways to do it. Republicans have offered with Democratic co-sponsorship in a number of cases, at least five major ideas for making a significant step towards stopping Washington from paying, uh, for, to stopping Washington from, re, from, from spending money that it doesn't have. Five ways to do that. There has been the Corker proposal, which is bipartisan, which would over 10 years uh, bring our spending, which is the real problem, from its present level, about 25 percent of our total output in the country, to about 20 percent, which is the historical level. There is the Balanced Budget Act, which is the most obvious solution to a nation that's spending more than it takes in. I mean, families do it, states do it, I mean balance their budgets, live within their means, the federal government can do it. We can, over time, get back to the point where we were not many years ago, where we spend about the amount of money that we take in. I know that as governor for eight years we did that. I know as a result of that we have almost no debt in the state of Tennessee, and as a result of that we can use our gas tax money, for example, to pay for roads instead of interest on the debt. Then there's a fourth idea that has bipartisan support, a third idea, that is the the gang of six that came out uh, this week. Now, the president said it was a gang of seven, that he thought I was in it. And I would have to say with respect, Mr. President, I'm a law-abiding law citizen. I'm not a member of any gangs. But I support what they do, because I think it's a serious bipartisan effort to help stop Washington from spending money that it doesn't have. And then there's another proposal that has bipartisan support, that Republicans as well as Democrats have initiated. Senator Isaacson has taken the lead on it, Senator from Georgia, and that is the two-year budget, which would allow us time every other year to focus our efforts on eliminating rules and eliminating regulations instead of adding so many. So there are four ways that we have suggested, and in some cases with bipartisan support, 
that we can take a significant step to reduce our debt while still honoring our financial obligations. And today, we're talking especially about cap, cut, cap, and balance. The legislation that passed the House of Representatives with 234 votes this week has come to the Senate floor. We're going to be voting on it in the next day or two. It has 37 co-sponsors. I'm one of them. Uh, I commend Senator Lee for his work especially on putting this bill together and in doing it in a way that would, that would attract the largest amount of support. This is a very reasonable proposal. The cut part is to say that for the first year, we would spend a little less than we did last year. Now, that's a reasonable proposal. In the state of Tennessee, uh, where I was once governor, the current governor is presiding over a state that's spending at a billion and a half dollars less than it spent last year. Now, they don't like to do that. There's some unfortunate consequences from it, but they still balance their budget and they're still getting along. And they're hoping for the day when the economy recovers and they'll have more revenues coming in without raising taxes. So step one is to cut what we're spending today in next year's budget. Then we cap. According to the economic output of the country over the next 10 years, the amount we spend over those 10 years. And then the third thing is to balance the budget, the most obvious solution of all. Over time, to say that we're not going to spend more money than we have coming in. This is our proposal to begin to control spending in a government that borrows 40 cents out of every dollar it spends. A government, the, economy, the economists tell us, is costing our nation a million jobs because of the high level of debt. This is an urgent problem. It urgently needs a solution. Now, Mr. President, uh, in conclusion, uh, almost all of us here in the Senate are good at making speeches. Now, that's one way we get here. But we've not become as good at the rest of our job, which is to get a result. The American people expect us to do that. They have to do that in their everyday lives. So they respect our principles, they respect our speeches, but they know our principles sometimes conflict. And in the end, in the end, we have to have a result. We have to have a result here. We have to find a way first to significantly reduce the debt and second to do it in a way that honors the financial obligations of the United States. And I've suggested five ways five ways that we can do that, including cut, cap, and balance. In order to do that, that means that each of us is probably going to have to accept as a part of the solution an idea that's not our first choice. But why should we be exempt from that requirement? That's what you have to do in a marriage. That's what you have to do in a family. That's what you have to do in a business. That's what we had to do in creating the Constitution years ago. This United States Senate wouldn't exist if it weren't because of a grand compromise. Otherwise, how could you justify two senators from Wyoming, and how could you justify the same number of senators from California? So much larger. So to get a result, after we make our speeches, we need to be willing to accept some ideas that are not our first choice. That is why I am a co-sponsor of several different kinds of ideas. Cut, cap, and balance the Corker Act, the Gang of Six proposal. That's why I support the Isaacson-Shaheen effort on the two-year budget. That is the kind of attitude we need in the next couple of weeks. So, Mr. President, cut, cap, and balance is, is a good way to meet our two urgent goals. Take a significant step to reduce our debt and do it in a way that honors our financial obligations. We are perfectly capable as a country of fiscally disciplining, disciplining ourselves. We are capable of reducing our debt, of stopping spending money that we don't have, and at the same time, avoiding turning the most credit-worthy nation in the world into a country that pays its bills out of a cigar box. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the floor.
senior senator from New York is recognized. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka. Senator from New York is recognized. Um, I ask unanimous consent the quorum be Not objections please. ordered. Uh, Mr. President, I have 12 unanimous consent requests for committees to meet during today's session of the Senate. They have the approval of the majority and minority leaders. I ask unanimous consent these requests be agreed to and these requests be printed in the record. Not objections ordered. Thank you, Mr. President. Now, Mr. President, as we spend the day debating the Republican plan, to cap, to cut, cap, and kill Medicare, a plan that is dead on arrival in the Senate. It's become obvious what the true question of the day is. That question, Mr. President, is will we as a nation allow ourselves to be driven into default and financial calamity by a small group of extreme right-wing ideologues in the House GOP? It has become increasingly clear that this group of ideologues has grabbed the reins and are refusing to let go no matter, who pry, no matter who tries to pry their fingers off. It is clear that this uncompromising group of narrow ideological congressmen is the one thing standing in the way of raising the debt ceiling so that our nation does not default. It is the group who alone wants to drive the car off the cliff. We are now 11 days from defaulting on our debt, and for the last few months, this small group, far outside the mainstream, has contributed nothing 
to efforts to reach a compromise. The House GOP has rejected every form of compromise from the Simpson-Bowles plan to the President's $4 trillion grand bargain to the McConnell fallback plan as of yesterday to the Gang of Six framework. Instead, they have offered dangerous schemes like the cut, cap, and kill Medicare plan that passed the House yesterday. Their quote, unquote, plan would wreak havoc on our country's seniors and on the middle class. It's not a serious proposal. It'll never pass this body, and it's a waste of time. So while reasonable people are trying to come to a compromise, the House GOP is becoming increasingly isolated. Yesterday, for example, my colleague John McCain warned the House GOP that Americans don't want the government to shut down and urged them to learn the lessons of 1995. Then, close to a third of Senate Republicans signed on to a plan that would combine major spending cuts with new revenues, a balanced approach that the House GOP has sworn off and every day more voters are abandoning them. As the LA Times reported this morning, quote, Republican resistance to compromise has turned a significant block of voters against them. Frustrated members of their own leadership as well as establishment GOP figures, unquote. So the House GOP is being criticized from every corner. And then today, we have what must be the most significant departure to date from the House GOP's fantasy land. In a major development, anti-tax crusader Grover Norquist told the Washington Post that letting the Bush tax cuts lapse would not constitute a tax hike. This is a development the significance of which should not be underestimated. It is a recognition from Norquist that the House Republicans are increasingly isolated and have painted themselves into a corner. Norquist is trying to signal to the House GOP that their no compromise position is untenable, deteriorating, and bad for their party and the country. The House GOP is on an iceberg that is melting into the ocean and even Grover Norquist is offering them a lifeboat. The question is, for their own good and for the country's good, will they take it? I urge my colleagues in the House to accept this lifeline. It's time to leave default denier, the, it's time to leave the default denier island and come back to reality. The House Republican extremists, those who are way over to the far right, painted themselves into a corner even to the right of Grover Norquist. Grover Norquist, the hall monitor, when it comes to enforcing the Republican Party's anti-tax pledge, has given House Republicans a hall pass. They should use it. This is a coded message from one of the truest believers in the Republican Party that it's time for conservatives to step back from the brink. Norquist has given us a potential path forward. If, the, if we decouple the Bush tax cuts now by only extending them for the middle class and not for millionaires and billionaires, we could have the foundation of a deal that includes revenues but doesn't violate the Norquist anti-tax pledge. This decoupling strategy is what the President and Speaker Boehner were entertaining earlier in the context of a grand bargain. But Leader Cantor and other right-wing hardliners forced the Speaker to walk away because they feared violating the anti-tax pledge. But now, a deal on decoupling seems to have Norquist's permission, if not his blessing. We should revisit it. It's time to recognize the quickest, most effective, and economically sound way to reduce our deficit and debt is a balanced approach that both cuts spending and raises revenues, a plan that mirrors every other successful deficit reduction deal in our nation's history, a plan along the lines of the ones negotiated by Presidents Reagan, Bush, and Clinton. I hope my colleagues in the House GOP see the danger of the path they are going down 
and change course before they take the entire country down with them. For a question. I'd be happy to yield to the Mr. President. The majority leader is recognized. I, I ask uh, permission to ask my friend a question through the chair. It's true, is it not, that you have served many years in the House? You served many years in the House of Representatives. Eighteen years, Mr. Leader. <clears throat> and you understand the difference between the procedures in the House and in the Senate, do you not? I do, some. And. In your years serving in the House of Representatives, uh, you have seen how quickly things can move over there. Is that right? That is absolutely right. And coming to the Senate, you have seen how slowly things have to move here in the Senate. Is that Indeed, right? Indeed, I've learned that hard lesson. I say to my friend through the chair that I see what developing now is very, very bad for our country. It's hard to comprehend. I ask my friend this question. It's hard to comprehend how the United States House of Representatives, and at the height of this fiscal crisis we have, has decided to take the weekend off. Are you aware they've decided to take the weekend off? I have read that. Yes, I have. And it appears to me one reason to do this is to do indirectly what they can't do directly. That is, we have, and I read them here this morning, uh, statements from my friend, the Speaker, John Boehner, saying we cannot default on our debt from the... Um, Whip over there, Eric Cantor, or Majority Leader, whatever he is, uh, second in command, saying we cannot default on our debt. I'm saying to my friend from New York that it appears to me they're going to do indirectly what they can't do directly by not sending us whatever they decide to do in time to get it done. I think that the country is staring in the face a default on our debt because of the House of Representatives being out this weekend. Would my friend comment on that? Yes, and I think the leader has an excellent point here. To not be here this weekend when the nation stares the first default in our 200 and some odd year history is amazing to me that they would be gone. And when you think about it, either they don't care about defaulting on the debt, and we know that Speaker Boehner does care about that default. I think he's aware of what terrible problems it would create for this country decades to come. So the answer must be what the leader is saying, and that is they hope to jam us at the last minute with something and say take it or leave it, which is playing with fire. And I can assure my colleagues in the House that that's not how we're going to play ball here. There's got to be a fair compromise not something that they come up with at the last minute and sort of toss it over here. That could create default. And if they do it, it would be on their shoulders. I say to my friend through the chair that they may send us something well-intentioned, but I'm not sure they understand the rules of the Senate. There are a number of people who are Republicans over here who have stated publicly they think the debt should be defaulted upon. And as, the chair, as my friend knows, most everything we do here is by unanimous consent. And if not by unanimous consent, by the rules of the Senate, which are very strict and very difficult sometimes to comprehend, but they're there. And so I'm afraid that what is happening with the House leadership is they think they can send something over here. and as the majority leader that I can figure out a way to get it done here. I can't get it done if we have to follow the rules, which we have to follow, and I can't get consent, and I can't get consent on most anything I do around here. So I would like my friend to comment on that. I, ex I, I appreciate my friend saying that um, Speaker Boehner is a good person. I agree with that. But I'm not too sure that this isn't an easy way out for everybody over there that they could say, well, we, we did what we ha wanted to do, and I'm sorry that Senate couldn't do it, so I guess our, our debt is defaulted upon, and we'll close down all of the functions of this government and wait for a better day. Well, I, again, I, in answering the leader, and there, first, the rules of the Senate would allow any single senator, and we have a whole handful, <laughs> to delay things day after day after day after day. And second, there are things out of the, any senator's control. For instance, any proposal on an issue like this would have to be scored by the CBO, 
We learned in the health care uh, legislation that CBO can't just sort of push legislation into a machine and an hour later say, here's your score. It takes days and sometimes weeks. And the fact that just about every procedural motion can be filibustered and delayed means that we're getting so close to the deadline that we would be in serious trouble. And again, I'd repeat, I find it terribly disconcerting. It's hard to see the anything but callousness towards the danger our nation faces if we were to default by the House not being here this weekend. Because the, even a rudimentary knowledge of the House procedures, which I know the leadership of the House has, would indicate to them that if they don't get us something very, very soon, and in fact, if they don't sit and negotiate and compromise, which they've refused to do, driven by a hundred, perhaps, congressmen, many of them new here, who sort of say, we don't care if we default. The consequences of default would be enormous and staggering and would not just go away in a month or two, but would be with us for a decade. And here they are, back home this weekend, when America faces one of the greatest potential economic crises that we face. So I very much thank the leader for bringing this up and asking these questions. Mr. President. The senior senator from Massachusetts is recognized. Mr. President, uh, I apologize to my colleagues. I know this, this has been previously scheduled. And I know the importance of what the senator from New York is talking about and the majority leader. Uh, and I completely agree with their comments uh, and, and would like to uh, share some thoughts on that at another moment. But at this particular moment, Mr. President, uh, we are privileged to welcome here a great friend of the United States, uh, the Prime Minister of New Zealand, uh, John Key. And New Zealand is a country that is in enormous partnership with us at this time, assisting in uh, Afghanistan, engaged in uh, trans-Pacific uh, trade uh, deliberations with us, and in many, many other ways uh, contributing to one of the strongest and best partnerships that we have uh, on a global basis. And therefore, I would ask uh, unanimous consent that the Senate stand in recess subject to the call of the chair so that uh, colleagues might welcome the Prime Minister to the floor of the United States Senate. Is there objection? No objection. No objection. So the Senate stands in recess until the call up to the call of the chair. Thank you.